Hey, good afternoon, everybody out there. Welcome to Piedmont Opera's La Lunch Live from, yes, here we are at Foothills Cocktails and, Cafe and Coffee here in downtown Winston-Salem. Those of you that are Piedmont Opera regulars know this is where we have La Lunch, and we're doing everything we can to be as normal as we can in the midst of COVID. So I hope there are some new folks out there, and if there are, my name's Jamie Albritton, and I am the general director of Piedmont Opera, and I'm very happy to be with you this this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about the opera we have coming up that we are live streaming from the Stevens Center. Uh, before I get started, I do want to say a great word of thanks to, yes, the folks you see behind me, Foothills uh, Cocktails and Coffee, uh, and Jenny Hess and her entire crew. They're very generous to us, and they let us sort of remain normal, if you will, by, by loaning us their space so that we are live streaming also to you uh, today for La Lunch. And I, I say that Foothills does a fantastic job of making sure that everything is socially distanced and their whole crew does their very utmost to stay uh, safe and healthy. So come on down and have a cup of coffee some afternoon here in downtown Winston-Salem, especially on a beautiful week like we have uh, heading here all week long. Look, the forecast looks fantastic. And I also want to give a shout out to our friends at Arbor Acres. Our, our presenting production presenting sponsor for Cinderella is Arbor Acres. We are so thrilled to have them back with us. The art of fine living. Uh, I couldn't think of a better partner to have in presenting opera than Arbor Acres. And I hope you guys are out there watching us. Thank you again, everybody at Arbor Acres. We're thrilled to have you as a production sponsor. So let's get started. Uh, today I've got a busy, busy agenda, so it's going to be a full hour. God help you. <laughs> But that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to, to keep it lively, shall we say. So today we're going to talk a little bit about opera and COVID and how they don't mix, but we're going to do our best to have them mix. Uh, we're going to talk about our composer because she, and yes, I said she, she's our first she uh, in 43 years of producing opera. She is a lady that may not be familiar to you all. We're going to talk a little bit about the plot of Cinderella, but I think most of you already know most of it. And then I'm going to have a chat with two of our principal artists from the production. So it's a busy hour, it's a full hour, but fortunately you don't have to listen to me to the whole thing. So let's get started. First of all, opera and COVID. What a challenge. For those of you that are real opera lovers, you know that part of the thrill of opera is the full orchestra in the pit, the principals, the, the, the chorus behind them, uh, the casts of thousands, right? Yeah, not so much in COVID. Everybody's very used to, by now, the social distancing six feet, wear your mask, which I normally do. Uh, okay, we've got issues in singing. Singers have been determined to be the super spreaders. Uh, when we usually speak, that's one of the reasons why we have social distance, distancing of six feet, because your speaking sort of spray, if you will, goes six feet. Well, we singers, big lungs, right, lots of air. So the social distancing for singers singing is 12 feet. So imagine that you have to have everybody on your stage, every single person, 12 feet apart from each other. Suddenly you go from cast of thousands to cast of fives. I mean, it's, it's a challenge to fit everybody on a stage safely during COVID. In addition to that, we all know some of our favorite moments of opera are love duets, right? How you do a love duet at 12 feet? Well, we're going to show you in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to talk to one of our principal artists about that as well. But it is a challenge, and I hope that you will hang in there with us during this COVID staging as we work through these challenges. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing uh, Madame Viardot's version of Cinderella is because unlike other ones that have choruses that are written with a full symphony orchestra in the orchestra pit, uh, Madame Viardot's uh, Cinderella is just for seven soloists, seven singers, and it was originally written for piano accompaniment. So in terms of COVID, it is exactly what we need at this moment. Never mind the fact that it's a fun fairy tale, which is also exactly what we need. So that's part of the reason why we are experimenting uh, during COVID with live streaming to you, with smaller casts, but still with delightfully produced opera. So thank you for hanging in with us during COVID. Thank you for, for, for being so receptive to these uh, online experiences. 
Uh, my next thing that I want to talk about, and this is sort of the meat of what I'm talking about today, is uh, Pauline Viardot. She is a composer that I'm willing to bet you're not familiar with. Uh, she is as well known as a singer and a teacher as she is as a composer. She was born in uh, the 1800s, 1821. Uh, she was born into one of the most operatically inclined, musically adept families of the entire 19th century. Her father was a very famous tenor by the name of Manuel Garcia. For those of you who are familiar with singing circles, you may very well recognize that name because he was considered one of the finest, not only tenors, but voice teachers of the 19th century. He created a system of voice teaching that is frankly still used today. Uh, he was a, a famous tenor first, and for those of you who are opera fans, if we think about the role of Count Almaviva in Rossini's very famous The Barber of Seville, he created that role. He was the very first man to sing Count Almaviva in The Barber of Seville. Needless to say, that's endemic of his uh, widespread fame all over Europe. Uh, he was he was in great demand both as a teacher and as a performer. It was into this family that Pauline Viardot was born. She was the last of Manuel Garcia's children. He had a daughter much earlier, and again, any of you that are familiar with the history of singing will recognize this name. His eldest daughter, who was a singer, was a soprano by the name of Maria Malibran. Maria Malibran, for a brief moment, was one of the most celebrated sopranos in the first half of the 1800s. She sang most of the bel canto repertory that we're familiar with now, Bellini, uh, uh, Ros San Rossini, different composers like that. She sang all of those operas for all of those composers, and they loved her performances. Her voice was considered one of the most beautiful of the time. Sadly, however, she died when she was only 28 years old. It was considered a massive loss uh, to opera uh, at the time. Pauline, being her youngest sister, that's what she grew up with, was her fabulous father and her fabulous sister. And point of fact, when Pauline was four years old, she came to the United States. Her father, Manuel Garcia, brought his entire family and his opera troupe to America, and it was the Garcias that brought the very first Italian opera to the shores of the United States. At the, at the request, if you will, of the librettist, the man that wrote the words for Mozart's Don Giovanni, he brought his entire troupe to America to give the first performance of Don Giovanni in New York, with uh, Lorenzo da Ponte, the librettist, sort of serving as the producer of that. And his wife, he sang Don Ottavio, his wife sang one of the leading roles, his daughter sang one of the leading roles. And there was today's composer, Pauline Viardot, at four years old, watching all of this happen, having just taken a boat over from her home uh, to, to New York to watch this. Uh, amazing life she led. By the time she was 18, she could speak five different languages and she would soon, soon learn even more. Uh, she would add Russian to the list before it was all said and done. Amazing, amazing woman. When her sister died, at that time she was really planning more of a career as a concert pianist. And at that time there were not very many women who were concert pianists. The, the concert stage was still very much dominated by men, and I don't say that, that with any pride. It is a result of the kind of life we led uh, in the 1800s. Nonetheless, that tells you something about the pioneering spirit of Pauline Viardot. She lost her father when she was only 10 years old, and her mother said, young lady, you are not going to be a concert pianist. Put all that away. You're going to be a singer. Now take a second and think about this. You know who one of Pauline Viardot's piano teachers was? Franz Liszt. Yes, the virtuoso pianist Franz Liszt encouraged her as a pianist. One of her best friends, Frédéric Chopin. She played piano duets with Chopin, and he always admired and advised her on her piano technique. Okay, whatever mama says, right? So mother said she should go to the stage to sing. And so she did. When she was, now listen, when she was 17 years old, okay? 
I'm trying to remember what I was doing when I was 17. I think I was in theory class and I was awkwardly trying to ask a girl for a date. And while I was doing that at 17, Pauline Viardot was making her London debut as Desdemona in Rossini's version of Otello. Yes, I got that right. Most of you are going to say, no, 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 that's Verdi. Verdi did write a version of Otello, but Rossini's was first. And actually, uh, Pauline Viardot was a great champion of that opera, and her portrayal of Desdemona was considered top four. It was an extraordinary thing, and it brought her to fame almost instantly. Uh, Viardot would have success in a lot of other different roles as her life went on. She sang, uh, some of you may not know this opera, but there's a famous opera by Gluck. It's a telling of the Orfeo and Eurydice story, where Orfeo goes down to Hades to s return his, his beloved Eurydice uh, to, to the earth. Uh, in Gluck's opera, the male role of Orfeo, as well as the, obviously the female role of Eurydice, are both played by women. Orfeo is played by mezzo-soprano. And Pauline Viardot was highly celebrated for her interpretation of Orfeo. She performed the role over 150 times. So it was a real signature role for her. In addition to dozens and dozens of, uh, all of the composers were after her. And as the, as the critics would say, her sister, we already talked about Maria Malibran, her sister had a beautiful voice. But Madame Viardot gave an extraordinary interpretation of everything she did. She sank everything into every role she did. And when you read her reviews, it's always about the intelligence she brought to the role. It is the intensity the dramatic intensity that she brought to these roles that made every composer uh, go mad for her interpretations. Uh, the composer Charles Gounod, we know him for Faust, he wrote an opera for her. Uh, Camille Saint-Saëns, his most famous opera is his version of Samson and Delilah. Uh, so many famous arias for the mezzo-soprano in that opera. And he was desperate for Pauline Viardot to give the premiere of Samson and Delilah with her singing Delilah. And <laughs> typical of her sense of humor, she very kindly said, my dear young man, I think it's a marvelous compliment you pay to me, but I'm too old to play Delilah. <laughs> and so he had to settle for another soprano. But nonetheless, he dedicated the score to Pauline Viardot, hoping that every mezzo-soprano that took up the role of Delilah would continue the dramatic intensity that he only imagined Pauline Viardot could bring to the opera. She went on with this fabulous career for years, and in the 1860s, she finally retired. She retired uh, to teach voice, and that's going to bring us to our opera. But as she approached her retirement, she made a huge cadre of, of friends that are the, sort of the who's who of musicians uh, across Europe, as, as, and, and not just musicians, but, but writers, painters, everybody. Uh, we've already talked about uh, Gounod, Saint-Saëns, Hector Berlioz was a friend of hers, Johannes Brahms. Uh, some of you are maybe familiar with his Alto Rhapsody. Brahms actually brought Viardot out of retirement to premiere the solo part in his Alto Rhapsody. So you see, she was one of the most cosmopolitan artists in all of Europe at the time. She also collected a certain amount of, um, how shall we say this, admirers. Uh, when she sang the role of Rosina, in the Barber of Seville, she was very popular in Russia. When she first began to, to sing in France, the French did not, were not interested in her. They had too many memories of her sister, Maria Malibran, and they shunned her. They actually were rather cruel to her and said, you're a little too ugly to be on the stage. So she said, fine, I'll tell you what, I'm going to sing everywhere else in Europe. And she did. And what, she was uh, very well beloved in Russia, particularly at St. Petersburg. And the Russian author, Ivan Turgenev, now Turgenev is not a name you know, he, he's, he's not one of the first Russian authors that we think of, but he is famous for his novel. You may have heard of Fathers and Sons, and he also wrote a very famous play called A Month in the Country. Turgenev was in the audience in Russia one day when she was giving a performance of Rosina, you know, Rossini's The Barber of Seville, and her performance was so impassioned and so overwhelming that immediately he went, he, I have to know this woman, I have to. He left Russia and followed her. He, she was married at the time, 
As I said, her father was Garcia, so Viardot was her, her married name. And her husband was, uh, he was a producer, he ran a, a theater in Paris, uh, he managed her career. She loved him very much, but Turgenev, this author, he could not leave her alone. It's a very strange situation that we find Madame Viardot in because she actually lived with both of them. They had a home, they were sort of shunned a little bit in Paris, and they had a home in Baden-Baden in Germany where the Viardots had a little villa right here, and then just across the yard, Turgenev had another little house, and they all just sort of happily lived together. Now, I'm not passing judgment on Pauline, and most people are very unclear about what the relationship was, but that's pretty open-minded, you gotta say, in the middle of the 1800s that uh, Louis Viardot is sharing his wife in some form or fashion with the great admirer and the famous Russian playwright Ivan Turgenev. I don't know, I don't know where to go with that, other than just to tell you that's the kind of lady we're dealing with. It's no wonder that she was a great soprano, she could have been a great concert pianist, and she ultimately was also a great composer too because she lived a very, very contemporary life by the standards of the 1800s, if you ask me. So, she turned to, com to, to uh, teaching towards the end. Of course, her father was one of the greatest voice teachers of the time, and so it came naturally to her. Even though he had died at 10, she absorbed all of his techniques. Her mother kept up with her uh, vocal studies and continued to teach her in the Garcia method, if you will, so naturally, one of the most celebrated sopranos of the time, she would turn to teaching, and indeed she did. Uh, she taught students in Baden-Baden in that first sort of setup, and point of fact, the, the Garcia living room, if you will, was where they hung out. The Turgenev living room became a, sort of a theater for them, and they hung a, a cloth across the middle of it, and Turgenev would write the librettos, and Madame Viardot would write the operas, and they would produce these little operas in their house for her voice students. They were considered salon operas because they were not written for the theater, they were written for the vocal salon that uh, Madame Viardot held with her students at the time in Baden-Baden in Mr. Turgenev's living room, but as I said, it was all flexible, right? We bend like tree and wind out in the woods in, in Baden-Baden, apparently. Eventually, uh, the health of both her husband and of uh, Mr. Turgenev began to falter, and so they left the woods of Baden-Baden and they came back to Paris to live. Uh, she had a fabulous home in downtown Paris. Um, it, you can still, you cannot necessarily visit the inside of it, but uh, I'll remember the address in a moment because it's on a rather famous street and there's a plaque on the side of the home. Uh, it's just across the, the river from the Tuileries Garden and there's a plaque on the side of the wall that says, uh, here, here lived the singer and composer Pauline Viardot until her death in, in uh, 1910. So she lived there, Turgenev had a, a room upstairs, as did her husband. Turgenev loved her, her music making so much that he actually had a sort of uh, an intercom. I mean, we don't have electronics yet, but he bore a hole in the floor and had this tube that would run from his bedroom to the floor below so that he could hear more closely all of the music that was made downstairs. And that downstairs was Madame Viardot's fabulous French salon. And it was there in 1904 that her opera, Cinderella, premiered. She wrote two more operas before the end of her life, both of them two librettos that she wrote herself, and they were all written for her students to perform. Cinderella was the first of the two, and she would cast her students, and then she would invite, and you heard of this list of glitterati that were her friends, everybody wanted to come to a Viardot salon afternoon or evening, and so she invited them all. They were the audience in her salon, in her sort of drawing room, and in it, her students would give performances of these operas, principally Cinderella for today's discussion, right? And that is the exact setting in which we are going to try to replicate for our production of Cinderella. Uh, for our performances of Cinderella, uh, Marilyn Taylor, uh, most famous as a soprano and teacher herself here in the community, but of course occasionally she's known as Mrs. James Albritton. But I say that only occasionally. 
uh, Marilyn Taylor is going to play the role of Pauline Viardot. And she is going to welcome us to her salon, and our, our stage setting is her salon in Paris. And she's going to ask her students to perform for you all her newly written play, her newly written opera, because it's a little bit of a play and a little bit of an opera. There's a fair amount of dialogue in this show, Cinderella. And that's the setting that we're going to find for our performance uh, coming up on the 19th and the 21st. So now you know a little bit about Pauline Viardot. You know what a, an incredible woman she is. Uh, as a composer, beautiful, beautiful music that she has written that because, again, similar to her fate as a concert pianist, no one encouraged her as a composer. Chopin did. Chopin said, uh, take my, my mazurkas and write vocal parts to them, and you're going to hear one of those in our performance. Uh, Chopin was very encouraging to her, and she wrote a lot of songs. She wrote a violin sonata, and as I say, she wrote five salon operas. And everyone's starting to reevaluate Pauline Viardot. There was a list that came out several weeks ago of the nine or ten greatest female composers and it started with Hildegard von Bingen clear back in the medieval era and went up to composers that are still alive Pauline Viardot was on that list so I think she's beginning to enjoy a little bit more attention right now as we reevaluate uh, the many talented women that were stifled thanks to a male dominated uh, field uh, throughout the 17, 18, 1900s and, and into the 20th century, frankly. I want to share one, before we move on to the opera, I want to share one so you get an idea about how funny and sharp and smart Pauline Viardot was, which you're going to see in her opera. She was out for an evening uh, concert with some of her students one evening. And they were listening to the great soprano, uh, Giudita Pasta. Pasta was, again, like Maria Malibran, she's one of the greatest sopranos of the 1800s. And uh, so they're going to this concert, and Pasta is approaching retirement. And this is a, this is a, a, a bit of a quote. Uh, they attended the late concert in London with the great Italian soprano, Giudita Pasta, who was clearly past her prime. God bless. That was my editorial. Asked by the student that she was with what she thought of the voice, pa Pauline Viardot replied, Ah, it is a ruin. But then, so is Leonardo's Last Supper. I think that's brilliant. And I think that comment sums up the sense of humor that Pauline Viardot brings to everything that I have seen her write, and certainly we'll see a fair amount of that in her opera, Cinderella. A few words about Cinderella, and then you've listened to me talk enough. I'm going to introduce our cast members, and they're going to join me at the table. Uh, you know the story of Cinderella. Uh, Pauline Viardot, during her career, was lucky enough to have sung both of the two big operatic versions of Cinderella. One was written by Rossini, and Piedmont Opera has actually produced that version. Uh, one was written by uh, Jules Massenet. The last Massenet opera that Piedmont Opera has produced was Massenet's Manon, which is his most popular opera. But he actually wrote a charming, charming, charming version of uh, Cinderella in which the, 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 the stepfather is not nearly as mean as he is in the Rossini one, which is part of its charm. Uh, Maria, I'm sorry, that's her sister, Pauline. Pauline Verdot was fortunate enough to have sung the leading roles in both of those operas. So she knew those two Cinderella versions very beautifully. And when she went to write her own, what she did is she took the best of both of those versions and kind of put them together to make her version of Cinderella. It's kind of brilliant when you stop and think about the fact that she was a teacher. So it doesn't matter which version of Cinderella her students might have gotten cast in one day. They're good to go because they understand the best of both of those shows. So in our version, indeed, Cinderella is the, the stepchild, if you will. She has two uh, stepsisters. I wouldn't call them wicked as much as I would call them possibly conceited and self-serving. They don't intend, they're not intentionally wicked. They just are spoiled. They're spoiled by their father in a way that Cinderella was not. Um, and they receive, as we are used to, invitations from the prince to a fabulous ball. And the ball occurs and a, a glass slipper is left behind and the prince goes to find, asks around the, uh, the, the countryside, comes to the family's home 
tries to slip her on the, the stepsisters, tries it on Cinderella, it, it's happy ending. So that part of it you're familiar with. Let's center in on a couple of the other parts. So Cinderella's stepfather, as I say, he's not a, necessarily a bad man, as he is a man that has a, a, a questionable past. And he sings a little song about that that pops up shortly after we meet the stepsisters. Uh, the stepsisters have just received their invitations to the ball when a little late in the day, Papa comes out to take his coffee. He, he's very clear. Cinderella says to, to Papa, good morning, Papa. And he grumbles at her and she says, she apologizes and says, I'm sorry, good morning, Baron Pictor Du, because they're, the family's last name is, I'll say it in English first, Pictor Du, but they all say everything because the opera, obviously, her, her salon is in Paris, so everything has a little bit of a French accent. So it is Baron Pictor Du. That's the family name, Pictor Du. You want to say it? Give it a shot. Come on. Pictor Du. Okay, your French is pretty good. I like it. So he admonishes her for having the nerve to call him a father, and then he sings us a little song about the fact that once upon, he's a baron now, but once upon a time he used to be a grocer, and he went through some shady dealings. He even spent a little bit of time in the penitentiary. But now, let's not talk about any of that. Now I am a great baron, and I am surrounded in the lap of luxury, and all is well. So the girls reveal to him that the prince has been here and invited everybody to a fabulous ball. So he says, wait, 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 let me change my clothes. I'll be right there with you. They go off to the ball. The fairy godmother comes, the pumpkin turns into the carriage, etc., etc. You know where we're going. Now, here's another big diversion in Madame Viardot's uh, uh, opera. In the first act, right at the beginning, a beggar comes to the house. He knocks on the door and he asks Cinderella for some help. That's a, 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 a device that she got from Rossini. Because in Rossini's opera, the same thing happens. The beggar turns out to be the prince. And he reveals that to us and says, oh, I'm, I'm looking around, I don't want anybody to know I'm a prince so that I can observe these ladies throughout the countryside and find one that's good and true and honest so that I can find a girl that might love me for me, not for the fact that I'm the prince. Cinderella goes to try to find the poor beggar a little something to eat or some money and instead she comes running back in, throws him a little coin and says, that's all I have and you should go quickly, quickly, quickly. Now, the prince decides to continue this sort of, I'm looking for uh, the right girl and I don't want them to know I'm the prince. He changes places with his chamberlain. And a chamberlain is just, it's a valet, it's a fancy word for the guy that helps me be all the fabulousness that is a prince, right? He changes places with his chamberlain so that the chamberlain is pretend, pretending to be the prince and the prince is pretending to be his chamberlain so that they can go around the countryside, have interaction with women, and the prince can sit back and watch how they behave with his chamberlain, whom they think is the prince, so he can figure out who the gold diggers are and who the honest girls are. At the top of Act 2, we actually get a little song from the prince's chamberlain. His name is Badigul. And Badi Ghul just basically is celebrating the fact that he gets to play prince for a little while. The prince catches him and says, come on, come on, shape up, shape up, act like you've got some sense. You're supposed to be the prince, so get some princely behavior on. And it is that relationship that ultimately will reveal uh, to all of us uh, who the prince really is. And all of those are devices that he got from Rossini. If any of you are familiar with the Rossini version of Cinderella, you will be very familiar with this. I'm not going to share with you the names from Rossini, but it's that same sort of changing identities thing. Uh, but the, the, the stepfather is a little bit more gentle than he is in the Rossini, and she got that one from the Massonet version. So again, she's pulled them all together to make the best version of the opera. So, long story short, which it's too late for. <laughs> the story is very familiar to you, but there are a few twists that are going to be new to you. So stay, stay focused, pay attention, and, and you will get a different version of Cinderella. Uh, we should say, uh, there are, the, the Cinderella legend, there are many, many, many versions of it. It started out as an Italian story, 
uh, the, the fabulist Charles Perrault, he's the French writer that made the Cinderella story most closely that we recognize now. The pumpkin, the glass slippers, all that came from the French version from Charles Perrault. And, uh, and there are other versions. The Brothers Grimm wrote a Cinderella version that is like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. That's a, but many of theirs are, but we're sticking with Perrault for right now. He's a friendly version of the story. So with that, I hope, uh, I, uh, Meredith is over there on the feed. If you have any questions or if I've confused you any and, and you want to know more, if, if I can clear up anything, please let us know on the Facebook feed. You can also always email us at info at piedmontopera.org and we'll do our best to get back to you. I, if we don't do it during the course of this show, uh, we'll do it later. Uh, but let me introduce now to you a couple of our cast members. I have with us today... Uh, Two young ladies, both of whom, uh, one is making her debut, and the other one, mm, I won't say it's a debut, but it's certainly the biggest role that she has sung with us. Uh, first of all, our uh, friend, the last time that she sang with Piedmont Opera, come on in ladies, I think they're afraid of me after talking for a half an hour, they're like, we don't want to be anywhere near this guy. This, uh, to my immediate left here, is uh, Alicia Reed. And Alicia Reed has sung with Piedmont Opera before. She was an undergraduate here at the School of the Arts. Now let her fill in that blank a little bit for you. Uh, but she uh, was, the last time that Alicia sang with us, she was the uh, shepherd, the voice of the shepherd in our Tosca several years ago. So you have enjoyed her singing, but you have not necessarily seen her the last time she was with us. And then to my extreme left over there, because we're trying to socially distance here, as we talked about before, is Julia Laird. And Julia, actually, this is her debut with Piedmont Opera. Oh, somebody just lost their job. This is, <laughs> this is her, see, we're at Foothills, I told you, it's live, right? Uh, this is Julia's debut with Piedmont Opera. She will be singing the role of, oh, the fairy godmother. And this is neither her first time singing this opera, uh, 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 or uh, she's had some, in addition to that, she's had some fun experiences with opera during COVID that I want to talk to her about with as well. However, let's start with you, Alicia. Uh, 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 you're a product of old the, the, the Tar Heel State, aren't you? Uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah, you're, all of your education, we can That's say, right. is from here. So just because we're all such pickle fans here, uh, tell us where you went to school. Yes, so I did my undergraduate degree at uh, UNC School of the Arts, and I graduated in 2016. Yeah. And, and she, while she around, was there, yeah. she sang with Piedmont Opera, she yeah. sang with us while she was still here as well, and then? And then I took a year where I was still singing around here, and then I um, went to grad school at UNCG. And what did you sing while you were there? Um, I did some I did some one act operas. I, I sang Helen in um, Hinosuru. Oh, nice. Um, and I, I did a, a modern opera called Talk Opera, and I was a, a very pared down form of Jilda. Okay, <laughs> all right. Show. Something you um, all are going to have in common. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I also did Queen of the Night. Yeah, lovely, Hunter. lovely, 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 and 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 that perfect perfect for you, right? Uh, that's the, the, the tricky thing about uh, uh, this particular opera is that Cinderella is a very, she's a, she's a little girl and you would think she would be written a little bit higher than she is, but she sings like a, a grown up, doesn't she? Very true. <laughs> <laughs> now, Julia, this is your, you, you have roots in North Carolina, yes? Yes. So I actually, I grew up, I was born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware. And when I was 16, my family moved to North Carolina. And so my dad went to UNC, uh, we're Tar Heel fans, but, uh, and my brother went to NC State, so we're also Wolfpack fans, so the house divided. She's got it all covered. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so, and yeah, um, I went to Arizona State University for undergrad and for grad school in opera performance, um, go Sun Devils. <laughs> and then I moved back here to be on the East Coast and to do some opera. And we're very fortunate to have Julia singing with us and to to uh, have her in the state. Uh, I, again, as part of that COVID thing, I've been very conscious of let's stay with the artists that we have here in North Carolina because we have such a wealth as you are viewing here at these two tables of talent here in North Carolina. And uh, Julia actually, how long ago...
that I last sang for you. Yeah, but I'm thinking of the. I remember singing. The, yeah, in, over first, in Crawford Hall at school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that was probably at least two years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's been a while. So, so you know, you never know, right? I keep these things filed away in amidst the cobwebs up here. And <laughs> when it came time for for uh, a fairy godmother, I was like, wait, where is Julia? <laughs> but. Uh, Julia, I would love for you to just spend a little bit of time telling us what you've been up to because you've done some really interesting projects that have been a result of COVID in Opera Land all the way across, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Tell us first about the Opera Delaware situation. Sure, so in Opera Delaware, um, they were doing these drive-through aria concerts where, um, I mean, basically Opera Delaware, they have this great uh, this great, great fire escape uh, stairway outside their building in downtown Wilmington, Delaware, and then a, a parking lot. And what they did was they sold tickets to uh, for each car, and we had time slots where basically people would come in and park their cars, and we would go out on the fire escape, and there were a couple of us, maybe four, four singers, and we, we would sing our, our set. And, uh, and then, you know, bow or whatever. And uh, whenever anyone was done singing an aria, all the cars would honk and it was, <laughs> it was you know, no clapping. And then, um, and then those cars would pull out and then a new set of cars would pull in. And so for, for like two hours, we would, we would just kind of do this, these sets. It was so, it was so well received. And, and I think Opera Delaware kept doing that. Amazing. Yeah, people really loved it. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, a car honking as applause. I'm yeah. going to ponder that in my heart. Yes, yeah. that's good. But now that's not all. You were uh, you were a young artist at Tulsa yeah. Opera. Yes. And your contract sort of went boing boing for a minute because they were having trouble figuring out what to do in COVID as well. Yeah. Yes, it was a little scary there initially. Um, you know they. Yes. And so uh, first Tulsa said, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to work this out because they, the season was supposed to be in, in September. And then kind of mid-summer they were like, hmm, we're, getting, we're getting some ideas. Would you be willing to, to come and work this out with us? And so, yeah, that was, we did Rigoletto and uh, we ended up doing it on a baseball field <laughs> so that we could be properly socially distanced which was hysterical. We made a baseball theme, so Rigoletto was the mascot, and, um, wow. and, and then it was the Dukes, the baseball team, the Duke, and uh, the Duke was the pitcher. And it was, it was just, it was really great and very complicated. I mean, we had, the rehearsals were, were there was someone from like the CDC making sure that we were rehearsing, because it ended up being the first live opera performed with orchestra, singers, and audience wow. in the United States since March. Wow. So it was a great thing to be a part of. And how did the, how was the orchestra arranged? Um, it was a small chamber orchestra, and they were at home playing. <laughs> and we were, we were beyond. Worked. Yeah, and so, yep, so Meister was at home plate, and it was, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Yep, yep, That's it was brilliant. really great. Yep. Wow. All right, so so uh, the, I guess the, the, the challenge is on now. I, what, truest Stadium, here we come, right? <laughs> yep for that? My yeah. team is not looking real excited about that. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put that on a list of things to do. Okay. So Cinderella, we are in the midst now of uh, maybe that's a good point. Uh, talk to us about rehearsing with these things, uh, we are in the midst of our rehearsals now, and we've got tape measures and masks and everything else. Talk to us, if you would, about you're both used to staging operas. From your points of view, what's different about staging opera in COVID? You have to be so much more careful about how you move. You yes. have to move differently. I mean, you have the normal like countering and turning and things like that, but you can't get within a certain <laughs> distance of anybody. So. You have to like stop yourself sometimes, and you're you're thinking, okay, well I can just go here, right? And then it's like, well, like, no, <laughs> I can't go there. <laughs> I can't hand this person this thing. It has to be done a different way. Exactly right. Yeah, the countering is definitely a oh, oh they're coming this way, so I gotta back off this way. Um, and then just also the fact that that um, honestly, as artists, I feel in in opera, there's so much touching, and you know, physical or or, or not, but it's very um, 
you're just very close to each other. And so to not be able to do that uh, feels feels a little it feels a little weird. Yeah. So it's something to get used to, but we're doing it well, I think. Yeah, Cinderella, we had this we've staged now the love duet. Yes. With Prince Charming, have we not? <laughs> yes. What what were some of the challenges I threw at you there? <laughs> well, we're st- when we started, we weren't looking at each other. I know we've changed that since, and I'm thankful for that because I feel more connected with the with the scene and with and with the prince now. Um, but it is it is challenging. You know, we have to walk in circles, and we have to to make it seem like we're really connected to each other and really falling in love in real time, just from 12 feet, so we can actually <laughs> sing at each other. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's you know it's an interesting I find because I'm sitting in the director's seat watching all of this happen. And I find it a fascinating, you know, as you say, Julia, we're used to touching each other. And so that's sort of the, 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 the immediate go-to, you know? And now we're kind of, I, what I see you guys doing is sort of reinventing, okay, can I actually reach my, my duet mate with my eyes? Um, and considering that, you know, we're also used to, uh, and I don't want to take the words out of y'all's mouth, but we're used to an audience being 20, 40, 60 feet away from us. And now the audience is in your face. So it's, I mean, I mean, talk to us a little bit about rethinking your ways as opera singers from that point of view. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good point and really what you're saying is that um, the easy choice, like when you're doing a love duet, is to be holding each other's hands and gazing to each other's eyes and being all close to each other. And so it really is challenging as an artist to think about, well, how do I show that I'm in love when I can't touch and I can't do the obvious, the obvious movements that maybe you learn in acting class or something yeah. like that. So that, that has been really, really interesting. And so, um, yeah, just, just kind of reimagining what it means to... to all about the eyes now because the cameras are right in your face uh, and you know in rehearsals you can't see the rest of our faces right <laughs> so and I have to say, as, as a director it's terrifically frustrating because they're singing a love duet like this so so I'm going I mean she looks like she's smiling but I really have no. <laughs> and, and, and then all of a sudden when we get to the Stevens Center and we're in a large enough room that we can actually afford to take the masks off and sing it's going to be Bam! You've got two days to make sure everything is there. So it's 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 a challenge. Uh, but nonetheless, what do you guys? Let's let's the 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 challenge is fun, I think, uh, because it's just you know I wouldn't say we're reinventing the wheel, but it's certainly making you exercise some different muscles, wouldn't you say? Um, so with that in mind, what do you what are you enjoying about Pauline Viardot and her Cinderella? Because I'm, I imagine now, have you ever sung any of her songs before, Alicia? No, I haven't. Julia? I I actually at Arizona State I was in a, a small production of this. Uh, oh, of this course exact you were. Yes. Show, and I sang one of the stepsisters. So I, I, this is a definite change in pace to, to be doing <laughs> the fairy godmother. But yeah, so to to revisit the music and to really think about it, it just I love how how charming it is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's delicate at times, and, yes, and then it's not at other times. And I think that. Yeah, I think, I, I like how she's written the character of Cinderella as not a victim. Mm-hmm. And I think that comes out in the music as well. It's not super high, and it's yeah. not all fluttery, you know? It, it's, she's, she's always like poised, and she's always positive, but you know, she's not a, a fluttery kind of character, and I, I enjoy that in the music. Yeah, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, yours is uh, appropriately so, the first voice we hear Unaccompanied. I think that's a really bold choice as a as a as a composer to say we're gonna let and, and your tune is kind of a folk song, isn't it? And and so the first time we get to hear Cinderella in an opera, and yes, it's a salon opera, but still she's singing just a simple could I impose upon you to maybe sing a phrase? <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> it's not that high. <laughs> no, it's not. There was once a prince so charming who wanted a wife. See, that's a simple little song, 
song, and that's the first music that we hear from Cinderella. It's 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 pretty, it's simple, and and we actually, as I said, this was originally written for piano accompaniment because it was in Madame Salon. Uh, so we have a piano sort of overture, prelude, and then the piano stops. It gets very low, and that's the first voice we hear. And for the longest time, there's no music in this opera. Uh, uh, let's talk about that for a moment, too. This opera doesn't have recitative like a lot of the 19th century operas we're used to. It has actually spoken dialogue. Now, it's a, it's a chamber, it's a salon opera, it's a but we're not performing in a salon. So what's the challenges for you guys uh, heading in and out of dialogue, singing, because particularly you have some crazy high singing, but you still got to talk. Yeah. So what, what, are there challenges there? Do you, yes, uh, honestly, I would much rather sing than speak in front of people in general. So, so we should have sung this interview is what you're saying. I know, yeah, I mean, that's all right for it. No, but um, so to kind of jump back and forth, it is, and and uh, and to make sure that when I'm speaking and I'm projecting, that I'm not gonna mess myself up for later when I do have to sing much yeah. higher. And so that is definitely something to be much more aware of. And stacking your breath and all these things—they don't teach you how to talk <laughs> in, in music. So Switching gears for me vocally, not not quite as difficult yeah. as it would be in, in, in other operas, but you do have to make sure that you're not rushing through the dialogue because so much of the story is right. in the dialogue. Yeah. So. And that's another interesting thing about dialogue is that all of the rhythm is chosen for you by a composer of your, your speech. Uh, and then all of a sudden, here we are, there's no rhythm, there's no anything, and, and of course we're singers, so we judge our tone of voice constantly, right ladies? <laughs> the answer is no. Right ladies? No, no. no of course you don't. No. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, another piece of that puzzle is, okay, if she wrote me a slow song here, and she wrote me a slow song there, and there's dialogue in between, is my dialogue slow? Is it fast? Is it a contrasting movement, if you will? Or is it a link to those two? There's lots of, and that's of course, I would guess, what's fun for you guys as artists, because for once the conductor can't say, no, it's a quarter note, right? If you, and at the end of the day, when it's a performance, you can say that stuff as fast or slow as you want to, and no maestro saying, no, no, con me, con me. You could, but that's a lot of work for you. <laughs> Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. It, it would be. I'd have to come up with a new set of gestures, wouldn't I? Yeah, a new kind of baton. <laughs> Speaking of baton, fairy godmother. Oh yes. You work a little magic in this thing, don't you? Yes. How? In a lot of control. She she is kind of a puppeteer, uh, especially in the party scene when Cinderella, of course does not follow her directions, does not obey, and... And that word comes up a lot, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> the fairy godmother says, please listen and obey. And what does she not do? Listen, listen or no. obey. <laughs> and so uh, the fairy godmother, yes, I get to use a wand and kind of direct things that are happening. And we had talked about sort of um, something that I thought was funny in rehearsal was, you know, uh, kind of giving me examples of how to be a maestro sort of because that's sort of what she ends up being yeah. in the show and then you know creating a pumpkin into a coach really fun <laughs> We actually had a little conducting lesson at one point when I was showing her. Now that's a strong downbeat because she dictates right. a lot of the blackouts in the opera. Right. So she's she's controlling the whole show. However, there is somebody else that is controlling the show, and we just put her in the mix in last night's rehearsal, and that is Madame Viardot. Yes. Uh, uh, and we had she actually ends up giving you. Well, I should let's not let's not give it all away. Shh, 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 shh. Huh? 
But what is it, so I, I have created here for us a little bit of a play within a play where Madame Viardot will welcome us all to her home, but then we do this show. And then every now and again, Madame Viardot steps into the show, particularly on your behalf. That's right. How is, how is that to sort of shuttle between reality and, and fairy tale in the middle of things? Is it weird or does it feel interesting or? No, it, it feels really interesting. It, 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 I think particularly for the second act, it kind of moves it along because we've, we've hit at the point where she steps in and we'll give it away, but <laughs> we've kind of come to a standstill where Cinderella is pretty sad for probably the only time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she moves it forward beyond that. So yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. There's a spot in, uh, of course, as I said, Madame has written this opera for her students and she has kind of, speaking of borrowing from other operas, she has kind of like a flater mouse moment in the middle of it where she anticipates that her students would sing a little entertainment. And so I've asked uh, both Cinderella and one of the stepsisters to fill in that gap with some songs that actually are written by Madame Viardot, but sort of carry the plot along a little bit too. And the one that you sing particularly, I just think that is the most heartbreakingly beautiful song. Do you mind telling us, because they're going to sing those two songs in French, do you mind telling us just a little bit about your song? Sure, yeah. It's, um, in terms of melody, it's, it's fairly simple. Yeah, it's strophic, and it, it was it's, 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 it's based on... Well, 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 well the, the songs are all in that series that she's singing. I didn't even put you on the spot, Alicia. I apologize, and I shouldn't have touched you because it's COVID. So there I go. Send me to the CDC. Um, uh, it, it, they're all based on 15th century uh, poetry. Yeah. Ah, okay. And so there's there's even in your your lyrics there's like the modern French and the ancient yes, French. And which right. one did we decide to sing? The ancient French. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it puts her again in that. She sings a folk song at the beginning. She right. uses the older text. It's sort of that whole earthy Cinderella thing. Mm -hmm. All right, I've interrupted you enough. Tell, <laughs> tell us what the song is about. It's, it's about seeing a person that you then fall in love with and realizing that your heart is it's not in your control anymore. And by the end of that song, who are you singing it to? The prince. Yeah, the, the, because you, <laughs> you, Cinderella, have your radar finely tuned, and you kind of right. always know who the prince is, don't you? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful little moment, I think, and, and, and so much beautiful music from Pauline Viardot throughout this. Uh, as we wrap up, ladies, any final thoughts about Cinderella? Other than everybody desperately come and, and send everyone yes. you know to come see it? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think what I would just say is that this is such a great opportunity for people who maybe wouldn't come to an opera to, to just come and enjoy it. And because it's in English, that makes it so much easier uh, to interpret. And then it's, it's a great show for kids. And then also just the fact that you can watch it from anywhere. I mean, I know that my family will be watching it from hopefully all over the place. And uh, y'all better watch. <laughs> And, you know, I have lots of friends who are going to tune in, and, and it just, that's something that it's so many people are part of something that can touch so many people, even if they're not here. That's great. Yeah, and this is my first time back on stage in a year. Wow. So, this is, it's been the most fun <laughs> for me, and I'll have family tuning in from Canada, I know, wow. for sure. So. And they haven't heard me sing it in several years, actually, because they can't come to any of the performances, right? Wow. So basically, whatever I'm in that's live streamed is all they can see. So I, I'm pretty excited for that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And thank you, Julia, for, for making it clear, because I have not. We will be singing uh, Madame Viardot's Cinderella in English. Now, the two songs that we interpret in the middle of the second part uh, uh, those will be sung in French because she, she, Madame was French, and we're going to explain what the songs are in the middle of the show. Uh, but otherwise, the entire show is in English, so don't feel like you need to worry about anything. We're right there. We're in English. It's a lovely translation uh, by Rachel Harris uh, that she's allowed us to use, so we're very grateful for that. So a few things before we go. Uh, I just want to remind you of a couple of more opportunities to find out more about uh, this opera. On Friday, uh, those of you that may or may not know, we have Opera Talk every Friday at noon. And on Friday, let me see if I can get this in the, there it is. I'm going to be talking with author Alexander Chi on his book, The Queen of the Night. 
Uh, our once in, a uh, once in a Blue Moon Book Club has been reading The Queen of the Night by Alexander Chi. It's a fascinating book. And in this book, Pauline Viardot is a character. She is actually, she becomes the voice teacher of, uh, of the leading lady in the book. Notice I said leading lady because it feels like you're reading an opera when you're reading this book. So again, Alexander Chi's Queen of the Night, I recommend it to you. And I'll be talking to him on Friday at Opera Talk. And then on opening day, uh, which is March the 19th, I'll be talking with Marilyn Taylor. I know, shocking, she's gonna make some time to talk to her husband sometime before 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about Pauline Viardot. And we're going to read actually some correspondence of Pauline Viardot's and talk about her remarkable uh, life and, uh, and uh, uh, her character uh, by reading uh, some of her uh, uh, actual letters. She was a great correspondent, would write friends 12-page letters, and we're fortunate to have them and still be able to read them. And I must thank, once again, Alexander Chi for cluing us in on some of those letters because those are the same letters that he used to help inform his version of Pauline They're all live streamed from the Stevens Center. No one will be in the theater, but you already have your seat chosen. You might be sitting in it right now. And uh, uh, we... ...second performance on Sunday, March the 21st, and that's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I hope that you'll consider tuning in to one or both of them. Your tickets, you can purchase them online at our website, piedmontopera.org, or you can call the office at 336-725-7101. Again, that's 336-725-7101, or piedmontopera.org. Uh, and I hope some of you are watching this on PiedmontOpera.org, by the way, so you already know where this is. Before you sign off, you can just click around and buy your tickets. So, thank you all so much for hanging in there with us during COVID. We've tried to be as intentionally normal as we can be during this very not normal time, which includes, thank you both ladies for joining us here at Foothills. Uh, once again, our thanks to Jenny Hess and the Foothills staff for letting us invade the space this morning. And of course, great thanks to our production sponsor, uh, Arbor Acres. Uh, I hope that you all are watching from Arbor Acres. Thank you so much for your support of the arts in this community and specifically of Piedmont Opera's Jenna Rentola. We're super grateful to you. Ladies, I think that wraps it up for this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in our live stream very soon. Until our next La Lunch in the fall, see you soon.